So when I was a senior in high school, I volunteered for my family to help clean this little church that we were all attending up in Indianapolis. <coughs> and we got there early one Saturday morning to get into the building and clean the church, but we did something wrong. We forgot to turn off the security system. And so uh, after we'd been inside for a few minutes and we had to shut off the security system, all these alarms started going off, you know, sirens and lights were flashing and things like that. And we couldn't figure out how to deactivate the alarm. We put in a call to the pastor and left a message about, hey, you know, we're in the church. The alarm's going off. We don't know how to turn it off. Can you give us a call back? And we figured since we were already there, just go ahead and start cleaning. And so I was in the entryway sweeping. Uh, alarms going off all around me. Um, but I, I noticed a shadow out of the corner of my eye. And I looked. And, and I just very briefly saw there was like a face in the window that when I looked, ducked back down quickly out of sight. And so I was like, oh, maybe that's the pastor here to like shut off the alarm. And so I, I went out the door and as soon as I stepped out the door, I saw the shadowy figure dart around a corner like they were running away from me. And I was like, this is weird. I'll do what any rational person would do in this situation. I'll chase that shadow figure <laughs> around the blind corner. And so I wouldn't recommend it, but I did it. I went running around the corner like, oh, I'm going to get some kid that's like messing with me or something like that. And as soon as I rounded the corner, I came face to face with the barrel of a gun, like pointed right oh my. between my eyes. So here's what had happened. The security system, when it went off, it alerted the police that there was a potential break-in at the church. And so an officer was dispatched. He peeked in the window, saw the shady looking teenager inside. Me, assumed that I was robbing the church when I came out the door running after him, assumed that I was going to attack him, try to take him out. And so he pulled a gun at me and there I am. He's got the gun right on me. He's saying, drop your weapon, drop your weapon now. And I'm like, I don't have a weapon. But then I look in my hand and I'm still holding the broom that I've been cleaning with. I was like, that probably looks like a weapon to him. So I threw it down. I'm like, officer, I am just here to clean the church. I'm just cleaning the church, which I'm sure is not an excuse that the police hear very often. And so he remained suspicious. He kept the gun on me actually until my dad came running out of the church. He's like, this is my son. He's just cleaning the church. It's okay. And even then he kind of put it down to his side, but he kept his hand right there on his gun until the pastor got there and said, oh, this, this guy's cool. He goes to church here. He's just cleaning the church. But it took multiple witnesses to convince this police officer that I was who I said I was and that I was doing what I said I was doing. And honestly, I don't blame him for that. If he's walking into a potentially dangerous situation, maybe life and death are at stake, I would want to be really sure that someone was who they said they were, that they were doing what they said they were doing. Well, today, as we continue on in our journey through the Gospel of Matthew, we're going to come to a point where we see a similar situation. God the Father, He knows that it is a matter of life and death that we get right the identity of His Son, Jesus Christ. Eternal life is at stake on whether we believe that Jesus is who he says he is and that he came to do what he said he had come to do. And so God wants to give us multiple witnesses that all say, yes, Jesus Christ is who he said he is. Jesus Christ has come to do what he has said he's going to do. And so we're going to see today in the Gospel of Matthew three very reliable witnesses speak up and make clear, unmistakable declarations of who Jesus is, of what he came to do. And my hope is that when we hear these testimonies from three reliable witnesses, that we would put away our guns, we would put down our defenses, we would believe the testimony of God's only Son, Jesus Christ. And so I want to read, we're just reading a few verses this morning. So I'm going to just read the whole passage, and then we're going to go and back and sort of look at it piece by piece. This is Matthew chapter 3, starting in verse 13. It says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan, to John, to be baptized by him. And John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, Jesus, and you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. 
And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. The word of the Lord. So we're told that Jesus made this trip from his hometown in Galilee all the way to the Jordan River for a specific purpose. He didn't come like a lot of the crowds were coming just to sort of watch and be amused and laugh at John's crazy antics. He didn't come like the Pharisees and the Sadducees did to critique or criticize John's message. But Jesus came to the Jordan to be baptized by John. And when he gets there, John says, Jesus... I can't baptize you. You might remember that last week, a core part of John the Baptist's message was this idea uh, that he said in verse 11 of chapter 3, where he said, There is one who is coming after me who is mightier than me, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. John was all of his ministry pointing to, prophesying about someone who was coming, who would be so powerful, so holy, so good, so pure, so righteous, that John's like, I'm not even worthy to pick up and bring in his flip-flops if he wants them. And so now John sees this one in front of him, this one that he's been prophesying about, pointing to Jesus Christ. He's there, and John says, Jesus I'm not even worthy to carry your flip-flops. How could I ever be worthy to baptize you? How could that happen? It says it makes more sense for you to baptize me than for me to baptize you. Now, John, he was a pretty holy, moral, upstanding, righteous dude. Uh, As a matter of fact, Jesus later said that of all the people that had lived up to that point in history— John the Baptist was the greatest person. Uh, That's pretty good, right? Like, that's pretty cool if Jesus thinks that about you. But John, even John, as good as he is, as, as holy as he is seeking to be, he still feels in the presence of Jesus this deep unworthiness. He's aware of his own sin and his own brokenness and his own need. So he says, Jesus, I'm not worthy to baptize you. He feels the same kind of humble recognition of his own sin and need that the prophet Isaiah felt. In Isaiah chapter 6, the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, he sees this vision of the Lord in his temple, and the Lord is high and lifted up, and his glory is filling the air. In Isaiah's response, he says, woe is me. He says, I'm a goner. I'm lost. I'm done for because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I've seen the Lord. He became aware of his own sinfulness and need in the presence of the God Most High, who was holy and exalted. In Luke 5, 8, Peter felt the same way. When he witnessed one of Jesus' miracles, Peter's response was, Depart from me, Lord, because I am a sinful man. I don't even deserve to have you standing here this close to me, Lord. He just became so aware of his own need. When we get a glimpse into the infinite glory and holiness and the perfect righteousness of God, we can't help but become aware that even our greatest and most righteous deeds are just like filthy rats. That's how Isaiah puts it. We look at the very best things that we've ever done for God and other people, and we realize how pitifully small and inadequate those things are. This is how Peter felt. It's how Isaiah felt. It's how John the Baptist feels as he stands face to face with God, the holy God, in the person of Jesus Christ. He says, I'm not worthy to baptize you, Jesus. And I get how John is feeling here. I get how he's feeling in the sense that I feel that way a lot. Like, even sometimes when I'm, like, preparing to teach and I'm studying the Bible, and I'm like, God, I'm not worthy to try to communicate your word to anybody. Like, I don't understand everything. I don't get everything right. And I just have this sense of my own unworthiness. But I understand how John is feeling in the sense that also, it is weird. It's weird, this idea that John or anybody else would baptize Jesus. Jesus is God, right? God the Son. Jesus is the one that Colossians says that everything was made through him and for him and by him. And why would God, 
God the Son, Jesus Christ, need to be baptized by anybody? Like, that's just a strange idea, right? John the Baptist, in his own words last week, he said that his baptism was a baptism of repentance. And does anybody remember what repentance means? My feelings won't be terrible. Change your mind and go the yes. other way. Thank you. You did get it. Um, yeah, it means changing your mind, right? It, it was a baptism. John's baptism symbolized a person changing their mind about God, about life, turning from their sins and turning to God. And getting baptized was just a symbol of that repentance. Well, Jesus doesn't need to repent. Jesus doesn't need to change his mind about anything. In all things, Jesus thinks the thoughts of the Father perfect, righteous, true thoughts. Jesus doesn't need to turn from any sin. Um, he doesn't need to be forgiven of anything. In all things, he is obedient to the Father. He is holy. He is righteous. There is no sin in him. So why would Jesus want to get baptized in the first place? Well, scholars and, uh, and theologians, they have lots of different ideas about this. Like some people, they say Jesus got baptized because he wanted to validate John's message. You know, John's message was repentance is a prerequisite for entering the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus got baptized to show, yes, that's true. That is God's command. You must repent to enter the kingdom of heaven. Some people say that Jesus got baptized in order to establish a pattern for those of us who would follow him. He wanted to set an example for us so that we would get baptized, so that we would follow him in taking that <coughs> step. Other people, they say that Jesus was baptized in order to more closely identify himself with us in our <coughs> sin and need. Us people who need to repent who need to turn from sin, Jesus wanted to identify with us. Uh, Hebrews 2, 17 says that he, Jesus, had to be made like his brothers and sisters, that is, like us, in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. The idea is that although Jesus had no sin or need in him, that he loves sinful, needy people. That he wants to understand how we feel, to understand the things that we go through. And so he wanted to be like us in every way that it is possible to be like a human. And that included being baptized for Jesus. Well, I think that there's truth in all those ideas. I think all of those theories are correct, but ultimately, Jesus doesn't explain directly why he wants to get baptized. He just says, John, let us do this because it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. He's basically saying, this is what the Father wants me to do, and so this is what we have to do. This is the plan, and I always obey the Father's plan, so let's do this, John. And John consents. And he baptizes Jesus. In John's gospel, the gospel of John, it, it gives us some more information. It tells us that from this moment on, from the moment John baptized Jesus, John began bearing witness to Jesus' identity. That everyone uh, that came around him, John would tell them about Jesus. And that every time Jesus came walking anywhere near John, John would stop everything that he was doing. And he would grow quiet. And he'd kind of like nudge the people around him and he'd be like, hey, you see that guy there? He'd say, look, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Amen. Numerous times John says that John the Baptist said that. Behold, the Lamb of God. He wanted everyone to know this was his testimony of who Jesus was. And so here's our first note this morning. The first reliable witness who testifies to Jesus' identity is John the Baptist. And John the Baptist testifies that Jesus is the Lamb of God who has come to take away the sins of the world. Jesus is the Lamb of God. When John calls Jesus the Lamb of God, he's using a picture from back in the Old Testament sacrificial system of worship. See, back in the Old Testament, if you read Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, those books, uh, when someone would sin, they 
were guilty. <laughs> and they deserved death. The wages of sin is death. But God provided a way so that the sinner didn't have to die. And the way back in the Old Testament, he said, if you would cover your sin and remove your guilt, you have to bring to me a sacrifice, an offering. And one of those sacrifices, one of those offerings was a lamb. But it couldn't just be any old lamb. It had to be a perfect lamb, a lamb without blemish. Couldn't have like some rash or fleas or like a little broken leg or something like that. It had to be a perfect, unblemished lamb. And the sinner would bring this lamb to the altar and he or she would lay their hands on the head of this lamb and they would say, God, I recognize that I have sinned, that I deserve to die, but I pray that you would accept this lamb's death instead of my death. I pray that all of my sin would be put onto this innocent, helpless animal. And that it would carry my sin. It would carry the punishment of my sin. That it would die in my place. And then that lamb would be killed and it would be burned on the altar. So John here says, Jesus is the lamb of God. Jesus is the perfect substitute who has come to give his life, to take the sins, not just of one person, but to take the sins of the entire world, all the sins of mankind, all the sins that they have ever committed, all the sins that they are committing, all the sins that they will commit, all the sins you have committed, that I have committed, ever will, to take the sin of the world upon himself and to pay the penalty for all of those sins. Right. He is the perfect, unblemished, spotless lamb, the innocent substitute. But Jesus is different from those Old Testament sacrificial lambs. The Old Testament sacrificial lambs, they had to be dragged to their death, bleating and screaming and kicking and fighting. They were unwitting and unwilling victims. But Jesus came and he said, I know exactly what I'm doing and I volunteer to do it. I willingly choose to be the sacrifice, to be the substitute, because I see mankind, because I see you, because I love you so much, I am going to be the one who can do what you can't do for yourself, who takes care of your sins, who bears the punishment myself. I willingly choose to die for you. And when we see this kind of love, the kind of self-sacrificial, voluntary, willing love of Jesus to become this Lamb of God, what can we say for what John said? What can we do but just grow silent in wonder and say, Behold, Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. John the Baptist testified that Jesus was the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. But we need more testimonies if we're going to believe we need more witnesses to confirm john's testimony and we get more witnesses god gives us another testimony this is our second note this morning god the holy spirit also testified god the holy spirit testifies that jesus is the gentle servant who has come to heal the wounds of the world jesus is the gentle servant Come to heal the wounds of the river, or the world. Uh, Matthew three sixteen it says, when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. Jesus comes up from the waters of the Jordan River for just a brief moment. The heavens are open. The veil between this material world and the spiritual world is just ripped open. Heaven comes just pouring and flooding down to earth. And God, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, God, the Holy Spirit, descended from heaven to rest on Jesus in a visible, uh, physical form like a dove. Years after this, on the day of Pentecost, um, the Holy Spirit would descend on the followers of Jesus, on the early church. And then he would descend in the form of uh, flames of fire that would come and rest 
on the heads of his followers. And the Holy Spirit revealed himself in that way on the day of Pentecost because he wanted to show that he had come to fill the followers of Jesus with this burning passion for the Lord, with this heat, with this energy, this explosive force to be witnesses of Jesus Christ, to burn bright like signal fires for Jesus' glory. But here, the Holy Spirit uh, chooses to descend on Jesus in a physical form <coughs> like a dove. Now, let's use our, our sanctified uh, imaginations and our, our, our uh, logic here to sort of think about this. Why do you suppose the Holy Spirit would reveal himself uh, in this way as a dove to descend on and rest on Jesus? Any ideas? Purity. Like, there's lots of answers. Purity. Purity? Yeah, you think it does, and these bright, white, beautiful doves. Um, yeah, and actually, one of the sacrifices in the Old Testament, um, if you were too poor to afford a lamb as a sacrifice, doves were one of the allowed sacrifices, but it had to be this pure, uh, clean dove. So yeah, this since this idea of purity in the dove, what else? Peace. Peace. Yeah, doves, even today, they're a symbol of peace, right? Um, there's the symbol of the dove with the olive branch in its mouth. Um, that goes all the way back to uh, the story of Noah, when that dove returning to the ark with the olive branch in its mouth, that was a sign to Noah that the earth was at peace, that God was bringing new life, that things were ready to start over again. And I think that all of those things are kind of wrapped up in this idea of the dove. Um, but I think that most of all, what the Holy Spirit wanted to communicate here was just this idea of gentleness. Um, doves are about the most gentle animal that you can think of. You know, there's lots of other birds, like roosters and hawks, they have these like talons that they'll like scratch you up and tear you out. Oh, they're kind of, they could be violet birds, you know, or eagles or vultures, and they have these sharp beaks where they can like rip apart flesh and things like that. Doves, there's nothing like that. Like, doves are just like the sweetest, gentlest little birds. All they do around is just kind of like waddle around and go, you know, they <laughs> hang out and cuddle each other and things like that. Yeah. Um, they're very gentle. And I think the Holy Spirit was communicating here that he was filling Jesus with a power not to rip and tear and destroy human life, but a power to gently tend to and heal the broken, to restore the loss and the hurting. The Holy Spirit here was fulfilling a prophecy spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 42, verse 1 through 3 says this, listen. It says, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, with whom my soul is well pleased. That sounds a lot like what God said at Jesus' baptism, right? God promises this. He says, I will put my spirit upon him. That happened at Jesus' baptism, right? And he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud a bruised reed. He will not break and a smoldering wick. He will not quench. God's chosen servant will be filled with God's spirit with such a gentle and tender heart that he says, even a bruised reed, he won't break. And a smoldering wick, he will not quench. So I went out in the parking lot this morning and I pulled this. This is not really a reed. This is some kind of weed, but same idea. It's, it's a plant, right? And this is a bruised reed. Do you see how it's kind of like broken over a little bit? It's bent. There's a weak spot in the in the uh, the stem there. Uh, well, you know, Jesus says he's not the kind of person that's rough. If he comes along and he sees something like that, he doesn't just grab it and snap it off and kick it down and burn it up, but he gently tries to restore and heal and put together that bruised reed so that it can grow, so that it can begin to thrive and flourish again and be what it's supposed to be. And it says, if he comes along and there's a, a smoldering wick, um, like a candle wick like that, uh, you know how candles are, are real sensitive. If you move around too much or if there's a little pop of air, you know, it's kind of dangerous. They, they kind of flicker and go out. Well, Jesus, he says he's not the kind of person that if a candle is flickering, he's just about to go out. He's not going to go and just like blow it out or, or, or quench it right away. But he's going to try to gently 
blow into and restore that flame and get it to glow bright again. And this is a promise for us about the heart of our Savior. If you're here today and you feel bruised in your heart, like your heart is on the verge of breaking and you're hurting and you're wounded, Jesus is the kind of Savior that can come to you gently and tend to the hurts in your soul and begin to restore you and heal you. If you're here today and you feel like the wick of your soul is kind of like flickering and smoking, getting ready to go out, you're losing your joy, you're losing your hope, you're losing your passion, Jesus is the kind of faith that doesn't just come and say, too bad for you, and stomp you out, but he comes and he says, I want to help you. And he begins to blow on the coals and try to restore and, and get that fire going again. He is a gentle and tender Savior. And the Holy Spirit testifies to this, testifies that Jesus is the prophesied servant of the Lord that Isaiah talked about, who would be gentle, who would be tender, filled with the Spirit of God to heal the broken and the dying in the world. But there's another witness, our last witness, so John the Baptist, he testifies that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, testifies that Jesus is the gentle servant come to heal and save the broken. And then lastly, Matthew 3, 17, it says, And behold, a voice from heaven said about Jesus at his baptism, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Last note, God the Father testifies that Jesus is the beloved Son, come to do His will. Jesus is the beloved Son, come to do the will of God the Father. God the Father speaks audibly, out loud, from heaven, in a way that everyone can hear, and He directs the attention of the world to His beloved Son, Jesus, and says, I am well pleased. With Jesus. The Father is well pleased with the obedient heart of Jesus. That Jesus has chosen to do his will in all things, to carry out the plan that they made to save mankind from before the beginning of the world. The Father is well pleased to <coughs> listen to the pleas and the prayers of Jesus and to save all those who come to him through Jesus. The Father is well pleased with his son, well pleased to place authority in the hands of his son, to save, to judge, to rule the nations. This is his beloved son with whom he's well pleased, and he says that out loud, audibly, for the world to hear. You know, I know lots of people that they say, I wish God would speak audibly to me. Like, I wish God would just say something to me out loud in a voice that I could hear with my ears. And usually what people mean when they say that, they, they mean, I wish that God would tell me audibly out loud who I should marry or whether or not I should take this job or if I should make this investment. If only God would speak audibly out loud. Well, in the Gospels, God the Father only speaks audibly out loud three times. Uh, here at Jesus' baptism, uh, at Jesus' transfiguration on the mountain, and then when, in response to one of Jesus' prayers on, on this, uh, during his last week on earth. And every one of those three times, what the Father is doing when he speaks audibly out loud is he is just drawing attention to his son, Jesus Christ. And he's saying, this is my beloved son, whom I'm well pleased with. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. This is my beloved Son who glorifies me and whom I will glorify. It's always just to point to Jesus Christ, not to tell someone who they should marry or whether they should take this job. It's always to direct our attention to Jesus Christ. And so while we may not be privileged to hear God's audible voice in our lifetime, maybe we will. I don't know. I can't say that sort of thing. But even if we don't, we know the sort of thing that God would say if he spoke audibly out loud to us. He would say, look at Jesus. Right. Believe in Jesus. Listen Amen. to Amen. Jesus. He is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And we can read what God said in his word. We can read his testimony about Jesus 
and we can choose to believe it. So won't you listen today? Listen to Jesus Christ. Listen to the testimony of John the Baptist. Listen to the testimony of the Holy Spirit. Listen to the testimony of God the Father. Jesus is the Lamb of God who can take away all of your sins completely and fully and eternally and save you forever. Jesus is the gentle servant of the Lord who has come to heal your brokenness, to bind your wounds up, to restore your joy and your hope and your passion. Jesus is the beloved Son of the Father with whom God is well pleased. And so we can come to the Father through His Son, Jesus. We can ask for what we need. We can be received by God because He's well pleased with His Son and we come to Him in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ. And so won't you turn your <laughs> eyes and your heart to Jesus this morning? Won't you trust Him, believe Him, and listen to the testimony of God's word. Now as the worship team would come on back up here, I'm gonna pray, and then we're just gonna spend some time worshiping, just focusing our eyes on Jesus Christ, drawing near to the Father through him, believing that he is who he said he is. If you need forgiveness this morning, if you came in here and you feel all dirty with sin and guilt and shame, come to Jesus, the Lamb of God, confess, your sins be forgiven. If you came in here today broken, hurting, exhausted, worn out from the week, Jesus is a gentle Savior. If you're a bruised reed, he won't break you. If you're a smoldering wick, he won't quit you out, but he will heal you and restore you. Ask him for what you need. Let us come to the Father through Jesus. Father, thank you. Thank you for sending your only Son into the world to take away our sins, to Heal our brokenness, to show us your heart and your will and your ways. We turn our eyes to Jesus this morning, open the eyes of our hearts so we would see him more clearly, that we would love him more deeply, that we would listen to his word and obey him. And we know it's not enough just to look and to hear the words of your beloved son, but that we must put his words into practice. Give us grace to do that this morning. Give us hearts to worship and honor you. Uh, the flames in us that are going out just fan up into a burning passion for you as we draw near to your presence this morning, as we approach you through Jesus Christ, your beloved Son. It's in his name that we come. Amen.